we talk a lot um, in our recommendations about number one, preserving physicians clinical autonomy. First and foremost, we should not have policies that undermine physicians' ability to, to provide appropriate care to their patients. Uh, medically indicated, um, according to you know the best medical uh, practice standards, that should be the, the care that physicians can deliver. And certainly the owners of practices should not be putting into place restrictions that somehow, or, or policies that somehow undermine that, right? We already have to deal with insurers that do that. I mean, don't, don't get a doctor started to talk about prior authorization or, you know, I mean, it's like, we've been dealing with that forever, but, but now you layer on employers that are putting those policies in place and think about that. That's, that's doctors having to fight on multiple fronts just to deliver the care that they know that their patients need. And, and that we think that's inappropriate. And so we 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 are looking at the appropriate safeguards for that. Some of that is making sure that doctors have leadership positions, uh, appropriate leadership roles in these organizations, right? That there is a, a physician voice in these organizations when it comes to clinical care, when it comes to staffing decisions. You know, you can't just cut and cut and cut when it comes to uh, nursing care and 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 other um, important you know clinicians. So, so that's kind of one major um, thrust of our recommendations. We ask for appropriate regulatory review, both at the stage of the acquisition um, and also kind of on an ongoing basis. Because some, some of the concerns that have been voiced about private equity particularly is that these deals are really look, the private equity comes in and they have a very kind of fairly short window that they're, you know, that they've historically kind of been involved in in a certain, they come in with a kind of three to seven year window where they're trying to kind of make their money in that period and then sell. Well, where does that leave, right? The, the physicians, where does that leave the practice? Where does that leave their patients? And so I think there's a lot of concerns uh, and we voice those in our recommendations about making sure that the, the, the decisions that the private equity firm makes does not re result in the practice being um, over levered, for instance, or just in a financial uh, situation that's that's harmful. Um, so we we ask for ongoing review as well. Um, and so I think that's kind of the heart of of our recommendations. We know there's a we're at the beginning of this. Education was really our goal here. But, um, and, and a lot of, again, a lot of this is gonna happen at the state level, but I think it's important for federal regulators to understand how all of these, as we said, all of these pieces fit together and, and to maybe start thinking about, because if you think about federal regulation in healthcare, 15 years ago, you know, the feds didn't have much um, impact on commercial insurance because that was really regulated at the state level. The Department of Labor regulates self-insured plans, but let's face it, they they didn't have a lot of regulatory um, requirements there. Um, but now with the ACA and implementation and the marketplace plans, the federal government now really does reach into a lot of the policies that are written at the state level, right? And, and so we can, we can urge them to use that regulatory oversight in ways that we couldn't a decade ago, and so or you know, 15 years ago, and so we think it's important that they work with their state, you know, counterparts, and really, you know, start to think about how to protect, you know, the integrity of our system.